Well, let's go ahead and take a, a moment and turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 6, if you will, please. Sixth chapter of Genesis. I have to say this at the outset, that Genesis 6 is a very controversial chapter, especially the first four verses of it in particular. And thus, it's a very difficult uh, passage to go through and to expound and to even understand. But uh, I hope you'll bear with me, and I hope you'll stay with me, and I hope that this might be a time of blessing this morning. Let's pause and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you that we have a Bible. And I'm thankful that the Bible has all the answers to human life that we have need of. I'm grateful this morning that we can learn in the name of Jesus. Lord, as we read in Ephesians 1, if you don't give us the spirit of understanding, if you don't enlighten the eyes of our heart, we're not going to get it. So I pray that you will do just that. You know the condition, and you know the need of every life. And so we pray, speak accordingly, and do it for your great name's sake. We ask it. Amen. Well, I'm sure that we can all trace the sin and the curse that it brought upon this world back to Adam and Eve, but I would remind you of this. Their moral failure was the result of the temptation. And you can't have a temptation without a tempter. And human sin really put the human race into a crisis mode. And it is very evident in this sixth chapter of Genesis where I've had you turn. However, when we begin to look at this chapter, I want you... I want you to see past the mere human sinfulness and the divine judgment that is uh, recorded here to see something much larger and to see something much more significant. Because I believe that what is recorded in Genesis chapter 6 is really the battle of the ages. I believe that what we have here in this chapter is a raging spiritual war that has been going on between God and between Satan and it is a war, a battle of the ages for rule over human life and in fact the entire created universe. And that's especially, I think, how we need to view the first seven verses of this sixth chapter. I think it's a war. In fact, that's what I've called verses 1 to 7. I've called it war. Listen to me. Biblical understanding of this chapter will give you spiritual insight and will, will help you to understand current events that are happening as well. For this to happen, I need to take you back. I need to take you back to the book of Genesis chapter 3. Okay, so keep a mark in that sixth chapter. Go back to chapter 3 and verse 15. This is our memory verse, and I told you that it is a very key verse in our Bible and in our study of the book of Genesis. And uh, I want you to look a little closely at this 15th verse of Genesis 3, and I want you to see where the hostility began. Okay? Where did this war originate? Look at the hostility mentioned here. I will put, this is God speaking, I will put hostility, that's what the word enmity means, I will put hostility between thee and the woman. He's directly speaking to Satan. There are two groups that are mentioned here. Eve, she stands for humanity, and then there is Satan, and of course, Satan, he has offspring because it talks about seed here. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. So between humanity, the seed of the woman, and also between Satan's seed, 
Now, who are the offspring of Satan? Well, I would say fallen angels are. I would say that demons are. I would say that whoever those people are that Jesus said, you are of your father the devil, that they would be the seed of Satan. And so I want you to see two groups here. There is the seed of Satan and the seed of the woman. There is Satan's offspring, you might say, and there is humanity that are pitted against each other. Not only two groups here, but there are two realms in this 15th verse. We're unpacking this verse to understand the hostility here. There are two realms. There is a supernatural spiritual realm which Satan and his followers and his cohorts and his forces fall into. There's also a natural and physical realm which humanity falls into. Okay? So two groups, two realms. And then it gets very specific. There are two persons. Look here in that 15th verse again. And it says, It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Two persons. Basically this, that Satan cripples humanity, and that that human seed, meaning Messiah himself, will deliver a fatal, crushing head blow to Satan. That happened at Calvary. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he partook of the same, that uh, through the power of death, through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is to say the devil. Okay? Two groups in verse 15 of chapter 3. Two realms, a supernatural and a natural, a spiritual and a physical, and then two persons. Two persons, Satan and Messiah. And I would just say in addition to that, every believer faces two kinds of enemies. We face a supernatural enemy who is mentioned here, who has forces that he works through. We read about it in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against uh, spiritual wickedness in high places. Right? Fact of the matter is, there are physical enemies that we have. Satan uses flesh and blood in our lives. But ultimately, he's behind it all. So in, in fact, there are two enemies you need to see. You need to see behind any enemy of God that uh, you are up against, anyone that persecutes you as a believer, that there is a spiritual enemy behind that. That's what Ephesians 6.12 is about. Okay. So I hope that we understand what's going on here, what's being said here about the hostility. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, now go back to chapter 6. And look at the first two verses with me. It says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all, which they chose. Following the hostility that was established in 315, I want you to see here in the first two, ver uh, first two verses of chapter 6 some immorality that's going on here. I want you to understand that what is happening here is supernatural. Just as what was said in that uh, 315, that the realm is not only a natural realm, but it's a supernatural realm. It's a spiritual realm as well as a physical realm. What's going on here in these verses is supernatural. It's deeply sinister, evil, historical event that's taking place here. There are two groups and two realms that are interacting. There is, uh, it, look, some people believe that uh, this is a reference, the sons of God and the daughters of men, 
is a reference to two human descendants, one of the line of Seth and one of the line of Cain. If we make those verses to refer only to the Sethites or the Cainites, their descendants, we cannot do justice to the terminology used here, nor to the context. The word daughters is used as a generic term to refer to women. And that they are said to be fair, it's simply the Hebrew word tov, they were good, and it it's, it's referring to their moral goodness, not to their physical beauty. And the sons of God is a very specific Hebrew expression. It's only used four times in the entire Old Testament, one of which is right here. The other three times in the book of two of those uh, uh, four times, it's a reference specifically to Satan, who is a fallen angel. The sons of God, the only way that it's used in the Old Testament in the four occurrences of it, always, without exception, refers to angels and not to human beings. We have some New Testament uh, uh, passages that I think really uh, back up what's, uh, what's going on here, that this is supernatural stuff that's taking place here, and it's not just uh, on a human level. It's not just human beings. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verses 4 and 5, we read, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, literally a special place, a special pit for them, uh, Tartarus, cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood upon the world of the ungodly. I want you to see the connection there, that in this passage, the Apostle Peter connects and links the judgment of fallen angels to the judgment of the flood. And then a parallel passage is in the book of Jude, it's verses 6 and 7, and Jude says, And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation or realm, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, or just like as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication or immorality, and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance, uh, su suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So here again is a connection where you have fallen angels that, as Peter says, or Jude says, are once and for all abandoned their original position. Uh, that word first estate is the same word that is translated principalities in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. They left their, they abandoned once and for all their original position, that angelic realm for the earthly realm, and their sin, if you see, is connected with the unnatural sexual relations of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's all I'm going to say about it. But what we have here is we have two groups and two realms. I want you to see that. And there are thus two persons and uh, two enemies. That's really what it comes down to. What I mean is this. Let me explain. There are two competing opposing bloodlines in these first four verses of chapter 6. In other words, something much greater is going on than just terribly sinful people that are being punished by a flood. There is, in these verses, a deliberate supernatural opposition going on. There is a satanic plan 
to short circuit and to overcome God's redemption plan. And when you think about it, here is, I think, what's happening. I think that Satan is engineering, genetically engineering, a superhuman race to counter that promised seed of Genesis 3.15. Because when you think about it, that promised seed, that Redeemer, is the center of God's entire redemption program. You remove that seed and you don't have redemption. And so I think that this is part of his plan to come up with a fake Messiah. That fake Messiah was prophesied, for instance, in the book of Daniel. And I think it really climaxes in the book of Revelation in a person that we know as the beast or the Antichrist. Look at verse 3. My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Here, I think, God is emphasizing not just the immorality, but he is bringing out the audacity of this race of people. That fallen angels attempt to bring a supernatural power to bear in the human race. Because when man sinned, God said, dying thou shalt die. Thou shalt surely die. And when man was kicked out of the garden, for lack of a better phrase, when man was banished from the garden, when God said, you can't enter because I don't want you to eat of the tree of life and live forever, have immortality in your fallen condition. I believe what's happening here is there is on Satan's part a desire to create this superhuman, powerful race of people that are fallen and they achieve immortality. And what he's saying in verse 3 is that, uh, that uh, people's lives are sustained by the life-giving Spirit of God. And God is saying in that third verse, I am going to mercifully extend the lifespan for 120 more years before I bring the flood to judge this mess, before I bring destruction. I think that fits very clearly also with the book of 1 Peter and chapter 3 and uh, the 19th and 20th verse. Let me just read those verses for you. It talks about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was quickened by the Spirit of God. He was brought to life by the Spirit of God. And by that same Spirit of God, verse 19, he, the risen Messiah, also went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was uh, preparing, with, uh, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. I simply believe that what he's talking about there is God gave 120 years for the people of that race to repent. And he was merciful in doing so. But the audacity of Satan and his plan to form this superhuman race of immortal fallen creatures in order to displace and to take over in God's plan. And then in verses 4 to 7, you see the depth you see the depravity, not only the immorality, but really the depravity of it all. In verse 4, these people, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became Gabor, mighty men mighty men, which were men, which were of old, men of renown or, or famed. And then look at verse 7. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Here is mankind and his sinfulness over the edge. 
And it's the descendants of this immorality that is uh, talked about in the first two verses. It is the descendants. They are called giants or Nephilim. Literally, fallen ones. Fallen ones. Not only referring to the, to the depravity of this people, but also the fact that they fall on other people in violence. They are mighty. They are great in their evil, in their power, in their violence, in their warfare. It really is, it, it paints a picture of people that were, that were uh, tyrants. They were rulers that were tyrannical. They were tyrannical dictators. They had control over people, these descendants. And they were very degenerate as verse, you know, when God made man in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, he designed man. What they did is they took that capacity and they produced only evil plans as a result of it. God saw that uh, the wickedness of man was so great that every imagination of their hearts was only evil continually. Well, you read Matthew uh, 24 and verse 38 where it says in the days of Noah they were, they were eating and drinking, they were marrying, they were giving in marriage. That sounds kind of harmless, doesn't it? But here's the commentary on that kind of stuff. It wasn't just normal life. It, it was involved in great depravity, great degeneracy was going on in the midst of regular human life. And so God, he determines to destroy them. Look at verses 6 and 7. It repented the Lord. Now God doesn't change his mind. That means he felt sorry in his heart. It repented the Lord. It grieved God, it says, in his heart that he had made them. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created. I've designed them in my own image. I, will, I have created them and I'll destroy them from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, because it makes me sorry that I've made them. It breaks the heart of God. It grieves God's heart is really what we see. It brings God's sorrow. You know, here's something to, to keep in mind. The curse that was placed on man and woman as a result of their sin in the Garden of Eden, it brought sorrow to them. But folks, our sin brings sorrow to the heart of God. That's what we see in the word greed there. It sorrowed God's heart that it had happened like this. And those three words in those verses, it repented the Lord, it grieved the Lord, and, uh, it, it, and uh, also the word made. Those words really kind of uh, relate to what is said by Lamech in chapter 5 and verse 29 uh, when Noah is born. He called his name Noah, comfort or rest rather, and he says, the same shall comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Well, those uh, three words in that 29th verse, uh, the, the word comfort, the word work, and the word toil relate to those three words that express God's feelings. He repented, he felt sorry that he had made, that he had designed them, and he grieved. All of those things coalesce there. In other words, what I want to say is simply this. What Lamech was saying was the natural thing that we human beings always want. We want relief from our afflictions. And you know, without, I hope I'm not understood by what I'm about to say, but this is very important. You know, we can only, we can only take so much comfort. If we get too much comfort, it's going to ruin us. There is a point where we have to realize that the things that God allows into our life, the things that are afflictions, are good for us. They're actually good for us. God uses those things in our lives so that we can come out and say with the psalmist, you know, it's good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn. I might learn of you, and I might learn what you say. And so... Men want relief. That's not good enough for God. 
God doesn't want relief. And you know what? God's people, if they're, if they're thinking like he thinks, they don't just want people to be relieved of affliction. They want people to be right with God. You know what I want to come from this pestilence or plague or whatever you want to call it that we've had that is upon us, thankfully diminishing? You know what I want to come from this? I don't want it to be wasted. I want this to bring up, this affliction to bring about a change of heart in us, first of all, the people of God, that we get honest with Him about ourselves and that it has that kind of effect upon the lost world as well, that it turns them to Him. Otherwise, it's a waste. We want relief. God wants us right. And you know what? When you realize the supernaturalness, when you realize the superhuman race that is being planned by Satan in this whole thing, universal flood, doesn't it? It explains that God is going to totally eliminate this, this superhuman race that uh, is upon the earth. But I don't want to close with that. I want to close with the fact that we're on a winning side. Mm -hmm. And what I see in the rest of the chapter is not war, but win. I think a biblical understanding of this passage is really the basis for a victorious life. In verses 8 and 9, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. He was a just man, perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. I see, I see a position there, a winning position. I see him, Noah, as really the representative of that. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The first time the word grace is ever found in the Bible, right here. And you know what he's saying here? He is saying that grace is an undeserved abundance of God's favor. It's an unearned abundance of God smiling on you. That's what it means Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He didn't deserve it, but he got it. God smiled on him. God abundantly favored him. And he is described in that ninth verse as a just man. He was a zadok. He was a, he was a Hasid, you might say. The first Hasid in the Bible was Noah himself. He's described as a righteous man because his righteousness was not in himself, but his righteousness was found in God. Now listen to me very carefully. Our self-righteousness in the eyes of God is filthy rags. We must have the righteousness of God put to our spiritual account. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord because he was depending upon God's righteousness in his life. And believers today are depending upon the righteousness of Jesus the Messiah in our lives. You know what's wrong with, uh, with Judaism today? They're going about to establish their own righteousness by trying to observe the law of Moses, and in doing so, they're completely neglecting the righteousness of God, which is only available on one basis, and that's by faith. The only way a person can ever be right with God is by depending upon what God has accomplished in your behalf, in your place for you to take advantage of, for you to receive. What this means is he was a man that had a personal relationship with God. Do you? Do you have a personal relationship with God? Do you know him personally? Or do you just know about him? Do you just do the things that you find uh, uh, written? Or what people tell you is the right thing to do? Or do you get it from God? Do you have a personal relationship with Him? He was just man. He was a perfect man, which follows means he was wholesome. He was sound. In, in his, he, he was right inside with God, and thus he was right outside with people. He was blameless in, in the eyes of men. He had right human relationships, and it all boils down to the fact, verse 9 says he walked with God. He walked with God. Hebrews 11, 7 says, By faith Noah did what he did. He walked with God because he walked by faith. He trusted God. You can't trust a God that you don't know. 
You can't depend upon God if you don't know Him. you got to come into a personal relationship with Him by trusting His righteousness instead of your own. And then you can walk with God. You can trust. You can depend upon Him because you'll know Him. You can't walk with God if you're not in agreement with Him. If there's something in the Bible that you don't agree with, you can't walk with God. Forget about it. You've got to take the Bible as a whole or you don't take it at all. And so if you want to walk with God, you have to trust Him. And to trust Him, you've got to know Him. You can't depend on someone you don't know. You've got to agree with God. You've got to be on the same page with the Lord in order to walk with Him. Can two walk together if they're not agreed? Really, to walk with God is to walk in step with Him. Walking is a step-by-step -step process. It's to keep up with God's pace. It's waiting for God. I found God's never in a hurry. You've got you to gotta wait for God to reveal His will to you. And if you step before He reveals your will, you make a big mistake. And I would say this, that really walking with God involves intimate fellowship with Him. You know what it takes for intimate fellowship? It takes time. You've got to be willing to spend the time to build this intimate fellowship with Him. You've got to take time to fellowship with God. And that's what he's looking for. And then in 10 through 12, the rest of the chapter, really, this is the winning thing. This is how the war is won. This is it. Not only the position that we, are, that we have in Christ, justified, uh, walking with him, but also the promise. In, this, uh, in these verses, there's a great promise. Verse 18, God says, But with thee, talking to Noah, will I establish my covenant. That's a promise. That's the first time the word covenant appears in the Bible, by the way. And, it, uh, and it's a promise that when this is all over, when you come out of that ark, and he gives the, the dimensions and, and, uh, and the instructions on building the ark in this chapter. When you come into that ark, you're going to emerge into a new world. You're going to step into a new age. And you know what? That's exactly what God promises his people today. That, uh, that when you trust Jesus, you become a new person in the Lord. And you become a part of a new believing remnant that like Noah and his family have the potential of bring, bringing God's blessing to a new earth, to a new world, to everyone. And the provision that God gave to Noah and his family was the ark, just something to shelter them so that they could survive, they could live. Did you know that the believer's ark is Jesus and that he shelters us and gives us life eternal because of it? Did you know that uh, the ark of the Lord Jesus is provision for everything that we need in our Christian life? 2 Peter chapter uh, 1 and verse 3 says that we have been given in Christ everything that pertains to life and godliness that we might escape the corruption that's in this world. We are delivered. We have provision based on the promise of God like Noah. We have salvation, deliverance, just like Noah had. When Noah came out of that ark, he entered a new world. And that really, I think, perhaps is a picture of a future Jewish remnant that at the end of the seventh week of Daniel, they, they will emerge into a new world. But I think it also could picture perhaps the believer's deliverance right here and now. Because the Bible says that one of the reasons we've been redeemed is not only to escape hell, but we've been redeemed from this present evil world. That because of that, we are new creations in Christ Jesus. Well, I haven't read the verses and I haven't talked about the ark. If you want to know what the ark looked like, uh, really we're only given a sketch, we're only given an overall proportion of it, the length, the breadth, the depth of it. Uh, I guess it would be considered a cargo ship. Uh, it was about 510 feet long. It was about 85 feet wide and 51 feet high. How many animals would fit into that ark? Well, uh, they figured it out. You could easily house the several thousand animal kinds that God brought to Noah. Two of every kind of land animal. And the key to understanding 
those animals that went into the ark is to understand the biblical use of the word kind, K-I-N-D. It's the Hebrew word min. And it's not every individual and not every species, but every kind. Well, one thing that's on my bucket list to do is to visit the Ark Encounter in northern Kentucky. If you're interested in studying the facts about the Ark that I'm not taking the time to look at this morning, you might want to visit AnswersInGenesis.org uh, 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 slash, I think, Noah's Ark. But uh, I have a little video clip that I want to share with you. It's just a four-minute clip before we close. From Okay, so I want you to take two key points away from this sermon this morning. Number one is that there are two kingdoms in conflict, God and Satan's. And you're currently in one or the other. And I want you to consider which one are you in, and are you in the right one? God's kingdom is the winning side, and you can live victoriously over all spiritual enemies. In fact, the Bible says, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Don't even ever think about defeat. That's not the path that you ought to operate on. You ought to look forward to victory, and believers possess a conquering spirit, and all the provision that we need are in Christ. We need to know that and claim that. And then the second thing is uh, what Jesus tells us in the book of Matthew, where he says, as in the days of Noah, so shall be in the coming of the Son of Man. They were uh, before the flood eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered in the ark, and they knew not until the flood came and took them all away so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Some, in some sense, history will be itself. Believers need to be aware of this as well as unbelievers that uh, the return of the Lord is going to happen unexpectedly. And the majority of people will be unprepared for it like those people that were unprepared for the flood. And so my point is, now's the time to make preparation. Now's the time to get ready. And if you want to be ready, you need to be in the ark. You need to be in Jesus. You need to receive him. Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, I thank you for the time that we've had together this morning. And I pray that those that don't know you would come to know you personally and have the righteousness of Jesus put to their account. And I pray that... Uh, we would be prepared for your unexpected coming as believers when you rapture your church. I pray, Lord, that uh, there would be a, a great uh, moving toward you as a result of this affliction that we're in and as a result of these truths that we've talked about. Lord, draw us to yourself and prepare us for what's ahead. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.